Many of you are already familiar with our guest speaker. For those of you who are not, uh, Pastor Steve Korch, Reverend Dr. Steve Korch, I should say, <laughs> is a good friend of our church. He is uh, one of the professors at Western Seminary. Uh, he served in ministry as a pastor for many years before God called him to become not just a pastor, but a pastor to pastors, uh, a trainer of pastors. And so he's one of the men who helps shape and influence my life in ministry. Um, he is a good friend of not only our church in general, but for me and Melissa personally, we love him and adore him so much whenever we get a chance to spend time with him. It's a rich blessing. And in fact, many of you know, a bit of trivia for you, that five years ago, Pastor Steve performed the wedding for Melissa and I. So he is a very valuable friend to us and someone we dearly love. So would you welcome up Reverend Steve Korch. Uh, great to be back with you. I love it. I, you know, I tell you this every time I come. I brag about you guys all the time. And I continue to do that. Uh, so far, I haven't found a reason not to. Um, so I've got you guys going with me here. And it's true that we have, uh, we have a partnership because, you know, not only have at Western have we trained your pastor here, but there are others who are involved in um, training at Western Seminary, and God is, is using the impact of Western in you. I mean, when each week when you're involved in the ministry, each day when you're involved in the ministry of this church, somehow Western is playing into you. So you need to be keeping Western Seminary in prayer. Now, if you want to know how to pray for them better, uh, and if you want to know a bit more about what is actually happening at Western, do we have a deal for you today? Uh, because we have, we're going to have a table set up out here, and we have um, a representative from Western, one that knows, every, she knows everything about Western. Uh, Muna, right here. Okay, Muna, you need to make sure everybody see it. The hand has to go high. There we go. This, you want to look for this girl out here, and she can answer questions about what. It may be that somehow, you know, God is working in your life as, uh, you know, one that, that may be involved in ministry in the future. Or you may want to just kind of take a course. You don't even have to, like, get into a big degree and all that stuff. But, but you're just, you'd like to, just for your own personal enrichment, take a course that takes you deeper into the scriptures and, and explore something. And so Muna will be out here. She can answer those questions, give you information. Just flood that table with her. She'll love it. Okay. Now, one other thing here that I need to mention is, oh, this is better, um, <laughs> is that my wife isn't with me. I know, okay, oh, okay, yes. Ruthie's not with me. Um, today, she's back in Santa Cruz at our home church. Uh, this is one weekend each year where they kind of celebrate the arts and honor all the artists in the church. And so she's involved in that. She's actually doing a demonstration uh, so the, there's, we have a Saturday night and then two morning services, and so that's what she's doing. Uh, so you might want to keep her in prayer because it is a bit of an overwhelming thing for her. Okay, now having said all that, uh, Josh mentioned uh, as, uh, in his prayer that it's, man, it's, it's, um, it's a crazy time that we live in. And see, if you're one that kind of tracks news and sees what's going on in the world, man, it can just suck the life out of you. Uh, watching what's happening in uh, places like Iraq where there's just brutal, gruesome things going on. Uh, or battles all over the world here. Uh, certain ones get the highlight of the week. You know, this past week uh, in, in Israel, that was, you know, one of the big highlights of the week there. But it's happening everywhere. Um, as well as natural disasters and maybe, you know, getting closer to home, things that are going on in your life or around your life. And it can be overwhelming to see that, that what's going on in the world today and, and that we do indeed live in a broken, fallen world. Go back. Um, uh, in fact, I was thinking about just this the past couple of days here. Uh, if I was to go back, um, oh, about 10 years ago when my mother-in-law was still alive. I can remember my, my wife and I, Ruth and I, were, were out one day with her, and I don't know where we were, but I can remember the conversation. She got into one of these, she was in her 80s at that point, and got into one of these things where you could just see her kind of drift off and be thinking about things. You know, one of those kind of things where, hmm. 
And, and as she thought of the kind of time that we live in, she said, you know, it's much harder for young people today um, to live out their faith. She said, it was a lot easier for me in the time that I lived in. But it's much harder for young people today. And while we were still processing that, she went on. She said, but you know, I envy you because you have an opportunity to live out your redemption in a way that it's unmistakable. I've thought about that ever since then. The idea that, yes, we live in a broken, fallen world where there's a lot of mess going on. But because of that, our redemption that is found in the person of Jesus can stand out in a way that it couldn't otherwise, where we are distinguished as those who have been redeemed, who have found new life in the person of Jesus. Now, thinking about that, you wonder, okay, what does that look like? And we can come up with all sorts of things. There's kind of the, 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 the basic answers to that. Maybe it's involved in um, social justice types of things. And there's a lot of those, and that's, that's a, a big deal for us now. But the question that comes to my mind is, what is it in the, the social justice? What is the quality in that that distinguishes us? Or maybe you would say it's in love. I mean, you can find the scriptures out there. The world's going to know us by our love. But what is the quality in the midst of that love that distinguishes us? And I've thought through this and, and all the different answers that we can come up with. And, and what I want to suggest, and I've got four weeks to work on it, so you don't have to buy it today. But what I want to suggest is that perhaps the quality that makes it pop the quality that, that identifies us, that marks us as being different, of having found new life in Jesus. Perhaps that quality is mercy. Mercy. I've thought a lot about this. Uh, in fact, leading up to, to this series here, I go back a couple of months here, and I, I first kind of had, you know, because of a sermon I was doing at that point and some study I was doing, came across this, this idea of mercy, and it was kind of like God kind of goes, ding, kind of pops it in front of you. And I thought, you know, I have never really dived into this and really pursued the idea of mercy through the scriptures here. It seems like it, it always kind of becomes kind of a secondary thing um, in conversation here. And I've never even heard a pastor give a series on it. I'm sure pastors have. I haven't heard it. And so I decided that I would dedicate the entire summer of going into this personally. So you're kind of in real time with me um, as we're going through this together. I'm doing it with us. And so when we came to this, I thought, okay, where do I start? Wow, there's just massive amounts of scripture. Where do I start? And so I, uh, I didn't kind of just throw things in the air and see what came down. But one of those that stood out to me was in the book of Micah. Book of Micah. Now, I'd like you to start finding your way there, because if you have a paper Bible, it might take you a while to find it. Um, it's buried back there in the Old Testament in what we call the, the minor prophets. And it wasn't because they were less important. It's just they wrote less. And so they, we, kind of, we collect those together. But find the book of Micah. And within Micah, we're going to look at one particular verse that has become kind of the battle cry of evangelical Christians today. I mean, it's one of those verses that comes up over and over and over again. But I'd like us to look at it and see it kind of in its, its context and bring it forward into a way that really highlights something for us. So while you're finding your way there, getting into to Micah there, let me give you a little bit of background on Micah. Uh, Micah was, was uh, a prophet that spoke to the urban culture. Okay, so he, he works with us, okay? He spoke to the urban culture, but he himself wasn't raised on the streets of, of one of the urban cities. He comes from this little nowhere place in the scriptures. You have to kind of have a big map to even find it. But God calls him to have a ministry speaking into an urban culture of the day. Uh, the reason he's called into that is because God's people have become, uh, have lost their distinction, and they're just like everybody else. 
And Micah is speaking to that along with some other prophets at the same time, Isaiah and some others that we might recognize more. Uh, Jeremiah is in this somehow. Everybody is speaking of this. Uh, and, and yet Micah's in the middle of this here. And part of what is, is fascinating about Micah is that he's, he's not only a prophet, but he's a poet. Now, that's good and bad because um, some of the other prophets just got in your face and just kind of told you, here it is, and, and, and laid it out for you. Micah pitches most of what he's talking about into poetry. And so you have to kind of read it almost like the Psalms as well as a prophet speaking. But he's speaking to this, to this culture that, that has history to it. God had redeemed them had brought them out of Egypt, a picture of a redemption that was yet to come. He had brought them into this land and had said, here, here is uh, all the blessing that I will give to you. He gave them Torah, the scriptures, the law, saying this is how to live as my people. This is how, this is how to live in such a way that I will bless you. This is what will be your distinction. Here's how to live out your redemption here. I want you to be a people that is different from everybody else, that puts on display what it's like to be loved by me, to be my people, the redeemed. Cool thing. But generations and generations have gone by. And now God's people, these that he has redeemed, are just like everybody else. No distinction. If you read through the, the book of Micah, what you can do in you know, 15 minutes, you know, 20, if you're a fast reader, you know, 20, 25 minutes if you read slow, okay? But if you read through it, the first couple of chapters in this thing, I mean, he is, he's describing a culture that sounds like ours right now. As he describes, he gets pretty graphic on this thing, that it was a, a, a sex-craved culture. And he goes back to that over and over again. He says, you guys are saturated with this thing. It's driving you. He speaks to, into a culture that has been so wrapped up into success and into wealth that it overwhelms them. And they're willing to do anything to get it. He speaks into a culture in which there are classes that are developing and, and there are those who have and there's those who have not and there's the oppressed and, and there's, there's all the stuff that we look at today and say, yeah, I, I get that. That's what he's speaking into. He says not to be that way. And as he works his way through that, it's an indictment like most of the prophets are saying this is, you know, God is, God is not happy with this. <laughs> This is not the way God intended it to be. And as he moves down to where we are, we're in chapter 6. Um, Micah chapter 6 is where he kind of closes in on it. And it comes down to saying, have I, have I become a burden to you? Instead of being the God of your redemption, the one who is the one who desires to bless you, have I, have I simply become a burden to you? And then he gives this, this classic statement here. This is where we come into it. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Uh, <laughs> when, he, when he gets to this point, it's just like saying, okay, look, I've already told you what is good. He says, I've already laid this out for you. I've told you what, what is good. And you can go back and you can find direct references. You go back into Deuteronomy and uh, Deuteronomy, what is it, 10, 17 or something like that, where, where it says there that God specifically says, here is what is good. Here is what I require of you. And it says that, that, you, that you love the Lord your God, that you, um, that you do what is right and that you live out your redemption. That's essentially what he said. And he goes through in detail on it. And, and through the Old Testament, he's given all sorts of it's very specific instructions on what is good, what God will bless. I've told you already, he says, what is good. 
Uh, what, what I desire as the evidences of your redemption, the good works that are to play out because I have redeemed you. Not so that you can become redeemed, but the evidences of your redemption. What is good? That's, it's a, uh, there's parallels to this. In the New Testament, I mean, you come to um, Ephesians uh, 2.10 and talks about the idea that we have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. There is to be evidence of our redemption that we find in the person of Jesus. There's to be natural outcomes of the fact that we have found new life in Christ. The good works of it. So I've already told you what is good, what it looks like. And what does the Lord require of you, he says. Now, at first blush, as you read that, it's almost like, like God has rules, right? You read that, and it's like it's God saying, okay, what, what are the requirements now? I've set you free, I've, I've brought you, but I've got, I've got rules. But that's not what it says. It's interesting that the word that God uses here as he speaks through Micah, what does the Lord require of you, is not a word that has to do with requirements the way we typically think of it. Instead, it's, it's a word that, has, uh, that, that means what does the Lord actually seek? What is he looking for? What is he searching for and expecting to find? That changed it, didn't it? It's not like rules that God has. Instead, he's saying, look, there, there's, there's a, a redemption that has happened. God has brought you out of one life and into another, and God is now looking for, he's, he's looking to find the reality of that played out. He's looking to find the evidence of redemption. He says, well, what does that involve? Three things. There's a triad here. Uh, first of all, what does it require? Or what is it, um, what does God look for? What is he searching for? What is he expecting to find in those that he has redeemed? First of all, to do justice. That's one we, we really get into right now. Like I said, this is, this is a, <coughs> uh, uh, something that, that within our evangelical churches that, that has become kind of the, the big deal. No, we're all, we're all into social justice, which is great. I mean, I, I get all that. That's, but that's, that's not fully what he's dealing with here. He's talking about how all the ways that, that you know, during his time, which matches ours, um, people were doing things that um, were oppressive, that, you know, taking advantage of each other or doing all these kinds of things that weren't right. But the word that he uses here, mishpat, is a word that... that um, basically means rightness rooted in the character of God. It's rightness rooted in the character of God. It's not just simply a matter of um, seeing something that you feel is wrong, but rather the idea of being able to uh, become familiar with, with what God has laid out as what is right and wrong. God's standard for things, how things are intended to work, and seeing the distinctions where it doesn't match up. Uh, it's, uh, it's justice not based solely on learning what the, the rules were, so to speak, the law of the Old Testament, and being familiar with that, but being familiar with God himself and his character. What doesn't match up with the character of God? That you do Justice. It has to do not primarily with my relationship with God, but how I relate to other people, how we interact with each other. Uh, let me give you a picture here. We, uh, recently, we had our grandson stay with us for two weeks. Ruthie and I aren't used to that. You know, it's, it, uh, our grandkids aren't around us all the time. I mean, we, we kind of do these little blitz things. That's what grandparents do, right? We kind of come into it, we, we spend a little time, and then we move back. Okay. Uh, and then we, you know, we do all these kind of cool things. Well, um, 
we decided that we were going to kind of establish a new pattern and that we would have our grandsons come and just be with us for two weeks. Just us. Uh, and that we would try and really invest in our, our grandchildren whenever we had these opportunities. But one of those would be a, a, like a two-week su two summer deal. So we threw ourselves into that. It was great. But what's interesting, you know, particularly for most of it, we had just two of them, the ones that are in Portland down with us. And they are way into justice. Uh, as in what is fair and what is equal. You know, so that if you, if you gave something to one of them, you'd see them kind of, as soon as they get it, they would look over at the other one. <laughs> no, it wasn't the idea that I got this. It's, is mine bigger or smaller than that one? Uh, or mine's red and his is blue. Actually, I wanted blue. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was this kind of thing. Or the idea that, you know, if someone got to do something and the other one didn't, I mean, they were all into it. We're very much aware of, of equalities and inequalities. You know, this the whole idea of equity. I want, I want things to be equal. And so often when we think of justice, it kind of runs through our own grid on this. But, but as preached here, it's rightness based uh, that is rooted in the character of God. That the more I know him versus just simply the rules, what is right. And, and Micah puts this into the midst of a culture where so many things were not right. Where the, the injustices were very obvious. It says this is not the way God intended it to be. And tells them, what does God expect? What does he expect to see because you are redeemed? He expects to see that you live out the character of God in practice. That you actually do justice. That you make it a reality in how you relate to each other. Not just that you get on board with some movement, but as, as you and I personally interact with each other, that I deal with you in such a way that the rightness of the character of God shows up in how I deal with you. That changes things. That you do justice. Second one on here, and this is the one that I want us to land on most. It's just that you do justice and that you love mercy. You know, as the more I've looked at this, I think it's easier to do justice than love mercy. Because doing justice is, is something, for one thing, that I actually can do. Plus, I have lots of material in the Old Testament to work with. What am I supposed to do? I can line it all. In fact, that's what the, uh, the, the Jewish people had done, particularly as you bring your way down to Jesus. They kind of codified it. They had, you know, 600 and some basic things and thousands of ramifications out of that. And they had it all figured out exactly what to do. But when it comes to mercy, he doesn't say do mercy, <laughs> but that you love mercy. Uh, <clears throat> the, the idea of mercy is, is something that, that God himself loves. In fact, as, as I look through the scriptures, it seems that mercy is one of those descriptions that God loves to use more than any other about himself. And when you start to look through the scripture, all the ways that God says, I am this, I am this, I am this, you'll find more about God being the God of mercy than anything else. And the God who, who loves mercy and the God who is filled with mercy and abounding in mercy. God loves this idea of mercy and wants to be known as the God of mercy. In fact, uh, as you get to the end of the book of Micah here, Micah says, who is like you, O Lord? The one who redeems and forgives. The one who loves mercy. God loves this. And looks for it in those who have been redeemed. The one who loves mercy. As I've gone through the scriptures and looked at this, I found that, that mercy is how 
where, where rises to the top. Every time Israel finds itself in trouble and, and somehow cries out to God, they're looking not to the God of just, justice, but to the God of mercy. When individuals find life closing in on them, they cry out not to a God of justice, but to a God of mercy. Whenever God speaks of the, the widows and the poor and the orphans and those who are oppressed, it's always in terms of mercy. Fascinating piece on this. So I find myself trying to describe it. I mean, if I was to stop for a moment and give you all a half hour and go away to try and figure this thing out and come up with a, a way of defining mercy, um, it's a lot harder than you think. I thought, well, this won't be that bad. And I've... I've messed with this a lot. Our typical thing, whenever we get into, if we were having a kind of a class somewhere, our typical thing to define mercy would be, well, uh, we put it alongside grace. And we say, well, grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And that's kind of our typical way of doing it. Okay? And so we like grace. I mean, this is, grace is a good thing because we're getting stuff out of this. Mercy has, the way we typically pitch it, has <clears throat> more to do with kind of a uh, forgiveness type of thing, that I've messed up and therefore uh, by counting on God's mercy that he's not going to nail me because of what I've done. That's kind of the way we do it. And yes, that is there, but it's not where mercy gets most of its definition. Um, here's some ways to, to define it, some, some words to use with it. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's like seven main words that are used to translate mercy. Uh, it has to do with things like showing compassion. Mercy requires a certain element of emotion that goes with it. It's compassion. It's kindness. In fact, these are all the ways it's being translated. Same word. Compassion, kindness. It's generosity. A generous spirit. It's blessing. It is having pity. It is being slow to anger. It's the idea of being predisposed to do good. To lighten the weight of life with those around us. to ease the distress of those around us. Now, on the other side, you can say, well, what's the opposite of it? Sometimes that's the best way to kind of get an idea. It's not only these things, but it's not these other things. The opposite of, of mercy is, is cruelty or hardness or harshness, revenge, being severe, severe or, or mean, Ultimately, it's the idea that I simply just don't care. Indifference. God calls us to love mercy. And that in doing so, it actually does something to our own soul. Proverbs eleven seventeen says that, that the merciful person does good for his own soul. The the trick in some of this is that for something to qualify as being mercy, it cannot be compelled by any outside forces. In other words, you can't command mercy. It has to come from somewhere inside us, something that changes inside us, that moves us to do things that we would not do ordinarily. Mercy. Uh, I try to think of examples to use and illustrations to use. And, and, um, and particularly on this first read, I wanted to find something that was the most dramatic example. You know, so it's not like, well, it's kind of a good one. I wanted to find someone that, that kind of pushes it way out here. That kind of, so we kind of move a little bit that direction and, and settle back a little bit. And I have one. I didn't have to think long. This goes back about, the story starts about a dozen years ago. Um, and I'm one step removed. This is, this was a couple, a young couple, a good friend with my daughter lives up in Portland. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at the time they lived back in the Midwest. And uh, this, this young couple, they're in their 20s, no kids at the time. 
um, just starting out, they're believers, and they're, they're kind of an idealistic view of life, which is great. You know, they kind of, yeah, that's good. Well, one of their neighbors, like right next door to them, uh, was this, this older woman uh, that they befriended. And, you know, they would do things together. They'd have her over, um, and, you know, for a meal once in a while. They'd take care of her house and all this. And they built a relationship with her. Uh, well, uh, it turned out that this, this woman's health was deteriorating. And got to a point where she was going to have to move into um, to a care center. And so as good neighbors, you know, they, they went over and they were helping her kind of pack up her stuff. And as they did, they, they were moving some books off of, of, of one of her shelves right above her desk. And, and a piece of paper drops out. And it's a note that she had written like a year before um, saying, please, please, please never commit me to a care center so that I won't have to live out my life in that kind of facility. And they stopped what they were doing. A couple talked with each other. And they said, we can't, we can't let this happen. Um, so they talked with her and they changed plans right then. They said, you can move in with us. So they did, moved her in. Now their initial thought was, well, this would be short. Okay, this is not gonna be a long-term thing. Obviously we'll find more family out there somewhere and, and this will you know, all work out fine. She had no other family. She was alone in this world. So they, they kept her there. The thing is she had, um, at that point, the early stages of Alzheimer's. And so as time progressed, she got worse and worse. Now, she was, she was one that was initially a fun person, laugh and joke with them. But as her Alzheimer's progressed, she became more mean-spirited. Um, and she lost a lot of her abilities to do things. Uh, it was a few years in when, when there was a job change and they were gonna be moving across the country. And they said, what do we do? I think her name was Elaine. What do we do with Elaine? take her with us. So they moved her across the country to this new place. Uh, shortly after that, uh, they became pregnant. What do we do with Elaine? We buy a larger house. Uh, as things progressed, I say progressed, uh, as they declined with her and her health became worse and worse, it came to a point where she needed care 24 hours a day. They couldn't afford to hire someone to come in, so they, they got jobs to where someone could be home all the time, back and forth, and watch this child that had come. They couldn't take vacations. I mean, what do you do with Elaine? They cared for her to a point where, I mean, she had, they had to do everything for her. I mean, like everything you could imagine. But they cared for her up until about a year ago when she died, and they were with her on her dying breath. I don't know what that does for you guys, but they have hero status in my mind. But they also capture the idea of mercy. Mercy. Micah says, that you do justice, but that you love mercy. And he uses the term here, ahab, that has the idea of emotion, that you are, you're caught up in this thing, that you love this thing, that it's something that, <coughs> excuse me, that, that you desire and that you long for, that you want more of, that you place high value on, that you, I love mercy. And he says that because when you, when you love something, it, uh, someone or something, you're always thinking about this. You're always, it's part of, of your, your whole mind process here. But also that, that by loving mercy, it infects everything else. It is to be that, that element, that quality that shapes everything. 
In fact, as, as we look into these coming weeks, we're going to show, we're going to see how, how mercy becomes the foundation piece for so many other pieces, for forgiveness, for love, for, for unity, for everything. Mercy becomes this huge element, this quality that becomes kind of the catalyst for everything else. I'm convinced that, that um, well, let me pitch this to you. Again, this is something you don't have to buy this week. I've got three more weeks to make it work. But I wonder if mercy reveals more of the heart of God than anything else we do. That when we act in mercy, the heart of God is most clearly seen and distinguishes us from others who might do something very similar. The quality of mercy, not, not obeying, simply doing things and not being ca getting caught up with, but mercy being caught up in this. That you do justice as you love mercy and that you walk humbly with your God. Actually, the first two equal the third one. That you walk humbly with your God. That you are attentive to him. That you, that you feel the very pulse of his heart as you walk. As I did this study, let me wrap with this. As I did this study, I... Um, I came across... A couple of weeks ago, I first started really re being reminded of it. Um, the account of David in the Old Testament gets toward the end of his life, and Saul has died, and the best friend on earth, Jonathan, has died. And, and one day, he, he's kind of musing to himself, is there anyone of the household of Saul that I can show mercy to? Or depending on your translation, kindness, or compassion. Mercy. And as he asked it, they said, yes, there, there's a son of Jonathan. He's, he's crippled in both feet. And David says, I will show mercy to him. And hunts him down and brings him into his home. Restores all the wealth of Saul to him and has Mephibosheth, his name, sit at his table for meals. I will show mercy to him. And so as I read that, the thing that pinged in my mind was that question. I asked myself, is there someone that I can show mercy to? So that I am actually acting this out. I want, I want some setting where I am intentionally choosing to show mercy. Now, the easy thing would be to find somebody that I don't know. You know, somebody out there that I'm not related to and all this kind of stuff and say, okay, I'll find somebody and I'll show mercy out there. But the inescapable one is my own brother. I mean, my actual brother. I have a brother that lives over in the Santa Cruz area. Um, a few years younger than me. He's a broken, broken person. Alcoholic. It's just, he's a mess. Lives in this little tiny shack of a trailer. Um, and when I go over to see him, I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of work for me to do that. I mean, I, I have to kind of talk myself into it. Ruthie gives me a pep talk and all this kind of stuff, and I go over there because uh, <laughs> it's, it's totally a one-way thing. Um, when I go, I'll knock on his door, and, and he'll say, yeah, come on in. Well, come on in. I mean, from here to the back wall is where you're sitting. So not very far. And usually he has been smoking so much that I open the door, and you can just see it billow out. Oh. He's usually pretty drunk. There's nothing to talk about because he has no life. And he could care less about my life. And so you have to kind of invent things to talk about. And spend time. I usually sit as close to the door as I can because I can't breathe if I get any farther in. 
I haven't seen him in six months. So here's my deal. I am going to, over these next weeks as we go through this, I'm going to enact mercy with my brother. And so you're going to get weekly updates. But my encouragement to you is to find some setting over these weeks where you can enact mercy. Where you can take the very things we're talking about over these weeks and play them out in real time. What does the Lord require? What is he looking for in those who have been redeemed? Not just then, but as Micah speaks about, redeemed by the person of Jesus. What are the works that God intends to see happen? Justice, rightness based on the mercy or the character of God. And, <coughs> excuse me, mercy, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. There are a lot of unanswered questions. We'll address them in the coming weeks. What does it actually look like? How do we do it? How do you become a merciful person? We'll look at those. But for now, dwelling on mercy. Let's pray together. Our Father, we know that you have called us to be those who are different, who stand out because of our redemption that is found in the person of Jesus. That because of new life in him, that, that there is to be a distinguishing aspect to how we approach even the same things others do. And Father, we know that one of those elements, one of those qualities that you look for is the very thing that you love and that you want to be known for. Mercy. And so, Father, we ask that you would work in us in such a way that the love of mercy and its playing out would be very obvious in us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.